acids and bases. This is another classic, you know, chemistry chapter. When we think of chemistry, we often think of, you know, acids eating away at metal and so forth. Um, you know, my third grade science fair project was all about testing household project, uh, products to see if they were acidic or basic using litmus paper. So what is an acid? Well, um, our kind of day-to-day -day knowledge would tell us that it's sour. Think of like Sour Patch Kids or lemon juice or vinegar. Um, they will also react with certain metals, what we call active metals. So if you put a piece of aluminum foil into some vinegar, it'll start to uh, slowly bubble, produce hydrogen gas, um, it'll eat away at it. Um, also, acids are corrosive, and they turn litmus paper red. And bases, on the other hand, would kind of be the opposite. They have a bitter taste usually. They generally feel slippery when you touch the, the solutions, and they actually turn litmus paper blue. Now, um, that's kind of our, our standard knowledge of it. Um, now, one fun thing that I like to do with my kids is I pick up some of these miracle fruit tablets, and these come from a berry that um, actually affects your taste buds, and so you cannot taste sour. And so what we'll do is we'll each chew on one of these tablets, and then um, we'll drink like a little bit of lemon juice, and instead of tasting overly sour, it actually just tastes incredibly sweet. And so we drink that, and it tastes really good. And then you drink some vinegar, and it doesn't taste sour at all until it hits your throat. <laughs> and then suddenly it's like, <gasps> and so my my kids are hilarious because they'll sit there and they'll drink some of the vinegar, and then they're like, <gasps> and they're like, Dad, can I have another one? <gasps> lots and lots of fun. Now, those are kind of the everyday definition of what an acid and a base is, but we actually need kind of a, a more sophisticated chemical knowledge of what an acid is. So it turns out that we turn to uh, Svante Arrhenius, who helped to develop the first definition, uh, what we call the Arrhenius definition of acids and bases. He actually came up with a lot of different things. In fact, he came up with the idea of the greenhouse effect as a theory that explained ice ages. Um, he has one of those names that makes him sound like a supervillain. Um, there's actually a crater on the dark side of the moon that's named after Svantarinius, which is probably where he hatches his uh, secret diabolical plots. <laughs> so here's a uh, photo of him. Um, <laughs> good old Svantarinius. All right, so what is an Arrhenius acid? Well, Arrhenius said that an acid is any molecule that dissolves in water to release a hydrogen ion. Now, um, sometimes I'll call this a hydrogen ion, sometimes I'll call it an H plus ion, sometimes I'll actually call it a proton. Because remember that if you look at your periodic table, hydrogen is um, number one on the periodic table, right? Which means it has one proton and one electron. Now when you make it into an ion by removing that electron, now it's just a proton floating around. Alright, so that's the Arrhenius definition of an acid. A base, on the other hand, dissolves in water to form hydroxide, which is the OH- minus ion. All right, so something like sodium hydroxide, you put that into water, it splits apart, and it forms hydroxide. Therefore, it's an Arrhenius base. Now, unfortunately, there are some limitations to the Arrhenius definition of acids and bases, although it is still uh, very popular among pirates. Ah, Arrhenius. <laughs> that was bad. Okay, anyway, so... Um, it turns out that this this definition works pretty well for many acids and bases. However, there are some problems with this. One problem is that um, the Arrhenius acids and bases have to exist in water, right? You have to uh, dissolve these in water in order to form the hydrogen ion or the hydroxide ion. And there are um, acid-base reactions that occur outside of water, like in the gas phase. And so that doesn't um, you know fit with the Arrhenius definition. Also, um, the H plus ion, the hydrogen ion, doesn't actually exist in water. You cannot have just a bare proton floating around in in water solution. Instead, what happens is the hydrogen ion will actually pair up with a water molecule. So H plus H2O makes H3O plus, and this is known as the hydronium. So that's actually a really important one. Remember that hydronium ion is H3O plus. Another limitation to the Arrhenius definition is that ammonia, NH3, is definitely a base. I mean, it, it changes litmus paper blue, it's bitter, um, it has all the properties of a base. However, notice that it doesn't actually contain the hydroxide ion. And so it cannot be an Arrhenius base because it doesn't contain hydroxide. So those are some, some limitations. 
So the next definition of acids and bases would be the Bronsted-Lowry definition. So to be a Bronsted-Lowry base, it ha um, a, a molecule has to be a proton donor or an H plus donor. A base, on the other hand, is going to be a proton acceptor. And um, you can't have a, an acceptor without a donor, right? And so these things always come in pairs. But I'm going to go ahead and, and show you in this um, equation what's going on. So we have HCl, and notice that the proton, the H plus written in red here, is actually going to get transferred. It's going to attach onto the um, carbonate ion. And so we're going from um, HCl, and this is turning into Cl minus. All right, and then uh, because it lost a proton along the way. Now the carbonate ion, CO3, 2 minus, is turning into HCO3 minus, so it gained a proton along the way. So that means the HCl hydrochloric acid is the proton donor, making it an acid. Carbonate ion, in this case, is the proton acceptor, which makes it a base by definition. So let's go ahead and um, try to identify which of these are acids and which are bases. All right, so the first thing we need to do is to identify um, you know, which proton is being transferred. So let's go ahead and look at H2SO4. If we track that through, notice that it's turning into HSO4, which means it's losing a proton along the way. It's donating a proton. If it's a proton donor, that means it is an acid, correct? All right. Now, that means that the other one has to be a base. So but let's go ahead and check that it truly is a proton acceptor. So H2O is turning into H3O+, plus, so it is definitely accepting a proton or gaining a proton along the way, making it a Bronsted-Lowry base. All right, we can do the same thing on the next one. So here we have this acetate ion, and then we have HI. Notice the HI is turning into I minus, which means that it's losing a proton along the way. So it's a proton donor, making it an acid. So therefore, the other one must be the base, but let's go ahead and double check. So here we have um, C2H3O2 minus, and now suddenly it has an H in front of it, right? So it's gained a proton along the way, making it a Bronsted-Lowry base. All right, time for the last one. Um, this one, notice that this is ammonia, Right? And so let's see if ammonia really is acting as a base in this case. Um, so H2O is turning into OH minus. So it's actually losing a proton along the way. So in this case, this is the acid. Now, uh, what about ammonia? Well, NH3 is turning into NH4 plus, so it's gaining a proton along the way, which makes this the base. All right, so truly all you have to do is kind of, you know, follow the money, <laughs> follow the proton and figure out where it's going. Um, whichever um, species is donating the proton has to be the acid and whichever species is accepting that proton is going to be the base. So um, sure enough, the Arrhenius definition um, it isn't quite sufficient and doesn't predict that ammonia is a base, but looks like the um, Bronsted-Lowry definition definitely shows that it is a base, and so that's, um, that's one of the things that makes the Bronsted-Lowry definition even better than the Arrhenius definition, and so it's the one that we commonly use. One other thing I want to mention, just kind of as a foreshadowing, is that notice that in this first reaction, uh, water is actually acting as a base, because it's, um, it's becoming H3O+, plus. it is gaining a proton along the way, or accepting a proton. In this last reaction, H2O is turning into OH, so it's actually losing a proton, it's donating a proton. So in this case it's a base, and in this case it's an acid. It turns out that water can, can go either, either way, it can act as an acid or a base, it depends on what it's reacting with. And we'll, we'll talk about that um, in just a second. But I want to go ahead and show you something kind of fun to show you how um, you know, protons can be donated from, from place to place. All right, so we know that a Bronsted-Lowry acid will actually act as a proton donor, and then a, a Bronsted-Lowry base will act as a proton acceptor. Um, so let me go ahead and demonstrate this using a deck of cards and some chapstick. And so what we're going to do is I'm going to, uh, um, I've got some chapstick here. You can uh, rub it on your lips if you want. And I'm going to actually uh, choose a card for you. Okay, Norm might have you choose this card. 
and we're going to see if that card can kind of donate some of itself to the uh, to the chapstick. So normally I'd, I'd go ahead and flip through like this and have you um, choose any card you wanted and then you could go ahead and just tell me whenever you want me to stop. Okay, we'll stop there. Alright, so it looks like um, that's your card. Alright, so your card's right here and I'm going to go ahead and put that in the middle and then um, if you look closely it says chapstick but it actually says Queen of Spades. Right? And so um, your Queen of Spades has actually donated part of itself, kind of like a, a Bronsted Lowry Acid has donated some of itself. Now, um, we could try this again. Go ahead and start shuffling through the deck. All right. And whenever you say stop, that would be your card. All right. Uh, three of Spades, it looks like. All right. Put that in the deck. And then if we rub this, we should be able to change this to say three of spades. Um, a little harder. <laughs> Doesn't seem to be working. Uh, well, actually, wait a minute. Um, might have donated a little more of itself. In fact, if I open this up, you can see that there's a card inside. And if I open up that card, you can see if this worked. And sure enough, it appears to be the uh, three of spades. So, um, in this case, the deck is acting as a Bronsted Lowry acid and donating, you know, a proton or donating part of itself, and then the chapstick is actually acting as a Bronsted Lowry base by accepting, uh, you know, that that card or, <laughs> you know, the the proton. All right. So, what makes a good Bronsted Lowry acid? Well, in order to be an acid, it has to have a, a hydrogen atom that it can donate, right? That it can ionize and turn into a a hydrogen ion and then donate that. So some common ones would include hydrochloric acid or hydrobromic, nitric acid or sulfuric acid or even acetic acid. And I've gone ahead and highlighted those ionizable um, hydrogen atoms in red so that you can see them. Now, there are different types of uh, Bronsted-Lowry acids. A monoprotic acid, mono meaning one and protic meaning proton, so a monoprotic acid will only contain one ionizable proton. So something like HCl, notice it only has one hydrogen ion, and once it's lost that one um, ion, it can't do anything else. Diprotic acids, on the other hand, contain two ionizable uh, protons. And so H2SO4 can actually donate both of those if it wants to. And then triprotic acids contain, up to, you know, contain three, um, and it can donate up to three of those protons. So phosphoric acid, which is in your your uh, cola drinks, is a, a triprotic acid because it's H3PO4. Now one thing I do want to mention is that bronsted Lowry acids may be neutral, they may be positive, they may be negative. There's no way to just look at it and be like, oh, that one has a positive charge, therefore it's the acid. It doesn't work that way. All right, You have to literally look at the reaction and follow that proton around and see um, where it's being donated to and where it's um, being donated from. Now, if a Bronsted-Lowry acid has to have a proton that it can donate, it would make sense that a Bronsted-Lowry base has to be able to accept a proton. And it can accept a proton because it has to have a lone pair of electrons. That lone pair of electrons allows for a, a proton to come in and actually form a bond. So for an instance, um, ammonia, a hydrogen ion can come in and it can stick to that um, that NH3, right, to that lone pair there. And so suddenly you would have NH4 and you'd have a bond between the lone pair and that hydrogen. Um, water, you can see, has two lone pairs, which means that it can accept a proton, and the hydroxide ion. So the hydroxide ion actually has three lone pairs and a negative charge, meaning it's very good at accepting a proton and acting as a Bronsted-Lowry base. Now, one interesting thing about uh, Bronsted-Lowry acids and bases is that when they react, when this proton is transferred, we could actually go in the reverse direction as well, and we could transfer that proton back. So what do I mean by this? Well, if we look at this example between hydrochloric acid and water, you'll notice that um, hydrochloric acid is, is transferring this proton to the water. Okay, So HCl is turning into you know, Cl minus. And then H2O is gaining a proton and becoming H3O. 
And so HCl is the acid and H2O is the base, right? So that makes sense. But what would happen if we actually went the opposite direction? What if we took one of these protons off of the H3O and we donated it back to the chloride? Well, in doing so, the, um, a, you know, the Cl would go back to HCl and H3O would go back to H2O. So we could actually reverse this, go in the opposite direction. But that's a bit confusing because um, that means the H3O is acting as an acid and then that means that H or that Cl minus is acting as a base, right? Because it is accepting a proton. And so this would be really confusing because if I asked, you know, which which species is the acid in this reaction, you could say, well, it's HCl or H3O. And so instead what we're going to do is we're going to say that H3O is the conjugate acid and Cl minus is the conjugate base. All right, and then we could actually talk about what are known as conjugate pairs. So HCl and Cl are the conjugate acid base pair because HCl is turning into Cl minus, and then H2O is turning into H3O. So that's a pair as well, a conjugate acid base pair. All right, and so the acid and base will always be on the left hand side of the reaction arrows, the conjugate acid and base will be on the right hand side of the arrows. And the easiest way to, to see um, or to figure out which one is the um, conjugate acid and which one's the conjugate base is simply to follow uh, things through the reaction. So HCl is turning into Cl minus. And so therefore, if HCl is the acid, then Cl minus has to be the conjugate base because the acid will always turn into the conjugate base. All right, and then if H2O is the base, then H3O has to be the conjugate acid because the base will always turn into the conjugate acid. All right, So that's how I do that. So let's go ahead and uh, practice with a couple of these, see if we can identify the conjugate acids and bases for each of these. So first off, let's go ahead and try to figure out which one's the acid. Well, it looks like um, here that H2CO3 is turning into HCO3, right? So this must be the acid, and so therefore um, it is turning into what? Well, it's turning into the conjugate base. All right, and then that means that H2O must be the base. Let's go ahead and check to see if it's a proton donor. It's going from H2O turning into H3O. Sorry, the, uh, not the proton donor, uh, the proton acceptor. So H2O is turning into H3O+. Plus. It's gaining a proton, making it a base, which means that it's turning into the conjugate acid. Let's go ahead and try another one of these. Notice that HF is turning into F-. minus. It's donating a proton. It must be an acid. So that means that F minus must be the conjugate base. Okay, and that must mean that here, um, this is the formate ion, and it is turning into, uh, it has an H in front, right? And so therefore, it gained a proton, so it's a proton acceptor, so it's a base. And if it is a base, then it must be turning into a conjugate acid. All right, uh, let's go ahead and try one more. Uh, let's see, so in this case, hmm, we have H2O and HSO4. It looks like HSO4 is turning into SO4, so it's losing a proton, it's donating a proton, making it the acid, which means that its partner here must be the conjugate base. And then H2O is turning into H3O, so it's gaining a proton, accepting a proton, making it a base, making its partner in crime here a conjugate acid. So does that make sense? Um, acids always turn into conjugate bases. Bases always turn into conjugate acids. Now I mentioned a little earlier that um, water was a little bit strange because it could actually act as either an acid or a base depending on what it's reacting with. 
So you can see in this example that water could um, gain a proton and turn into H3O plus, or it could lose a proton and turn into OH minus. So it can either act as an acid or a base. It's amphoteric. Ampho meaning kind of like an amphibian. It can either live on land or water type thing. So the um, same type of thing happens with HSO3, the um, bisulfide ion. So notice that it can actually turn into um, H2SO3 by gaining a proton, or it can lose a proton and turn into SO3 2 minus. All right, so um, amphoteric, these aren't common but water is by far the most important one. But just be aware that it can go either way. So you can't just sit there and memorize it and be like, okay, water is always an acid, water is always an acid. It's not. It depends on what it's reacting with. Now when an acid and a base come together, they will neutralize each other in a, an acid-base neutralization reaction. And you can tell that this is occurring because you'll have an acid and a base, and then you'll always end up with some kind of ionic salt. Right, some kind of ionic compound and water. So pretty simple to uh, recognize. So let me show you an example. If I take um, HCl and mix it with NaOH, this will turn into literally table salt and water. And so therefore, this is a neutralization reaction. Or I could take something like acetic acid, mix it with um, baking soda, so this is a classic baking soda volcano with vinegar and baking soda, and I'll make sodium acetate, and then water, and carbon dioxide gas. So notice that in this case I actually produced some carbon dioxide gas, but I still ended up with a, a salt, right? So a metal and multiple nonmetals makes a salt and water. And so salt and water every time, and then sometimes you'll get some gas bubbles coming off in the mix but the salt and water is what's most important to recognize that, that neutralization reaction. Now, I mentioned at the very first slide that acids also typically react with metals. They react with some of the more active metals. They don't react with things like uh, gold and silver, the coinage metals, but they'll react with kind of the lesser metals, things like iron or um, uh, copper or um, you know, different things like that. So let me give you an example. Uh, hydrochloric acid mixing with aluminum. So if you were to swallow a little piece of aluminum foil, it would mix with your stomach acid to produce aluminum chloride and hydrogen gas. And so that's typically what you'll get when you mix an acid and metal. You'll get some kind of salt, some kind of ionic compound, metal and multiple nonmetals or one or more nonmetals, and then hydrogen gas being given off. Luckily, hydrogen gas is, um, you know, <laughs> flammable, so you can actually trap that and then light a match and get this little explosion. It's kind of fun. Now there are a lot of different acids out there in the world, um, but there are only six common strong acids. Now what do I mean by strong? Do I mean dangerous? Well, yeah, they are dangerous, but, uh, you know, especially if they're concentrated solutions, but strong is a, a term that means that the acid will dissociate 100% in water. So for instance, if I put in 100 molecules of hydrochloric acid into water, all 100 of those will break apart. They'll ionize or dissociate in water. All right. Same thing with like nitric or sulfuric. 100% um, will break apart. So you should know the six um, strong acids. Uh, learn their names and their formulas here on this table. Uh, it's on your slides. And luckily, if you memorize these six strong acids, then all the other acids out there have to be weak acids. And so if I say something like, hmm, let's see, um, ants, when they bite you, they inject formic acid. All right? In fact, uh, the Latin for uh, ant is formica, formica, and so um, it turns out that formic acid is what they inject, and that's why it burns and hurts so bad. Um, and so formic acid, is that a strong acid or a weak acid? You'd say, well, it's not one of the six strong acids that Mike gave me, therefore it must be a weak acid. So weak acids will um, only dissociate to a few percent. So for instance, if I put in 100 molecules of HF into water, um, maybe only two or three would actually dissociate and break apart. Now, weak acid does not mean that it is um, not dangerous. So hydrofluoric acid, this is an acid that eats through glass. Um, you get it on your skin and it will actually uh, go right through your skin 
without burning it and it'll actually uh, um, dissolve the calcium right out of your bones and kill you. There was a, a sad case years ago where um, a graduate student was was trying to reach something on a higher shelf in the lab and they actually stood on a, a big like 10 gallon bucket of hydrochloric acid or sorry hydrofluoric acid HF and the lid broke and they fell into it you know up to their knees and um, within a few hours they were dead there's not a whole lot you can do um, to to stop it um, some weak acids like H3PO4 is phosphoric acid. We drink that in our cola drinks, you know, every day. Carbonic acid. This is in, you know, seltzer water. Um, acetic acid, HC2, H3O2. That is in vinegar. Five percent um, acetic acid is vinegar. Um, but then some of them, like HCN, which is hydrogen cyanide gas, extremely deadly and will kill you very, very quickly. Actually, makes your lips turn blue. Hence the name cyan, cyanide. Um, as it you know chemically suffocates you. Now, if there are six strong acids, well, it turns out there are six common strong bases that you should be aware of. And just like with the acids, a strong acid dissociates 100% in water. A strong base dissociates 100% in water. So, um, lithium hydroxide, for instance, or sodium hydroxide. Sodium hydroxide is Drano. Um, it's actually, if you get it on your skin, it will literally turn your flesh into soap. That's how you make soap, is you take animal fat, including human fat, if you've seen Fight Club, and uh, you it'll and you mix it with Drano, sodium hydroxide, and it turns it into soap. So you should definitely lock that stuff up if you have small kids, um, because, yeah, I've actually had to go through a training course where I saw some emergency room photographs of a kid that had actually... Uh, gotten into the Drano and drank some of it and literally their mouth and esophagus just starts foaming up and turning into soap. Very, very gross stuff. Also, um, oven cleaner. Turns out the oven cleaner, if you've ever sprayed it into a hot oven like they recommend um, on the label, it's such a stupid idea because that's literally Drano as well except in an aerosol form. And so when your lungs start burning, yeah, that's because it's turning to soap. So I don't like to mess with stuff like that. There aren't ter too many chemicals that kind of scare me a bit, but things like uh, oven cleaner, especially just knowing that people don't know what it is, very, very nasty stuff. Oh, I should mention that if it's, you know, if a base is not one of these six strong bases, you can assume that it's a weak base. So if I say, um, let's see, magnesium hydroxide is commonly used as an antacid, right? Milk of magnesia. And so, is that a strong or a weak base? And you'd say, hmm, not one of my strong bases. It must be a weak base. Now, because I mentioned that, um, that water is amphoteric and can act as an acid or a base, what about if you just have a bottle of water sitting there, um, you know, in front of you on your desk? Can't the water molecules act as both an acid and a base? Can't one water molecule say, well, I'll be an acid and you be a base? and we'll go ahead and react. Well, they can. In fact, this does happen. So you'll notice in, in this case that we can actually take one of our protons off and we can actually donate that to another water molecule. And so in this case, um, let's say that you know this one is donating a proton. Um, so by doing that, it's turning you know this guy into H3O+, and then this guy is turning into OH-. So one of them is acting as a base and one's acting as an acid. So, kind of a strange thing. Luckily, this only happens to, you know, a tiny, tiny amount, right? Maybe two in every billion water molecules actually react this way, which is a very good thing because otherwise, half of your water bottle would be a strong acid and would, you know, burn your throat, and then the other half would be a strong base and would turn the rest of you to soap, and that would be a bad thing. So, again, this only happens to, you know, a tiny, tiny extent, but we can actually measure this. This is kind of an interesting thing. If we take um, the hydronium concentration, so notice that the hydronium ion here is in square brackets. That means concentration of. So the concentration of hydronium ion, multiply that by the concentration of hydroxide ion, you'll get this number right here. This is known as the ion product constant of water, or Kw. And it's always the same number, 1 times 10 to the negative 14th. Now what this means is that in any solution, any aqueous solution you have, 
if you measure hydronium concentration and hydroxide concentration, the product of the two will always be 1 times 10 to the negative 14th. So that means that if, if H3O plus concentration increases, the OH minus concentration has to decrease in order for the, the product to be um, the same, right? And therefore, if this one decreases, this one has to increase. So it's kind of like a, a seesaw, or where I come from, we call them teeter-totters, where you get on one side and one side goes up and the other goes down. Or you could have them both you know, perfectly balanced and equal. So speaking of acids and bases, we can't do that without discussing pH. You've heard of pH before um, when you watch one of those commercials for shampoo and some woman is like, you know, showering and she's having a really great time washing her hair and some voiceover guy says, pH balance for maximum volume and anti-frizz. And it's just, you know, kind of stupid. But um, anyway, what they're talking about is pH is a measure of how acidic or basic a solution is. Basic is sometimes called alkaline. So anyway, um, the scale goes from 0 to 14. Um, that number 14 is kind of weird, but do you realize where it came from? If you go back a slide, remember that number, 1 times 10 to the negative 14th? That's why it goes from 0 to 14. All right, right there in the middle is um, neutral, and so a pH of 7 would be a neutral solution. All right, and then anything that's below that would be considered acidic, and anything that's above that would be considered basic or alkaline. So what does this mean in terms of hydronium and hydroxide concentration? Well, it turns out that when you have a neutral solution, it's not because you don't have any hydronium or you don't have any hydroxide, but instead, what this means is that you actually have um, equal amounts of these things. So, if it's neutral, it's because you have equal amounts of hydronium and hydroxide. If a solution is acidic, it's because you have more hydronium and less hydroxide. And if it's basic, it's because you have more hydroxide and less hydronium. So again, it's that, that seesaw effect where one goes up and the other has to go down, or it can be neutral in the, you know, in the middle there. Now, you can see, you know, you don't need to memorize these or anything, but here's some pHs of common substances. So battery acid, which is sulfuric acid, has a pH of 1. Your stomach acid, which is hydrochloric, has a pH of 1 to 3, depending on what you've been eating and, you know, how full your stomach is and so forth. Lemons are about 2.3. Soft drinks range between 2 and 4, so they're very acidic, which is why they're bad for your teeth. Um, rainwater, uh, just by itself, is actually slightly acidic. Um, just, you know, it's about 5.6. Human blood has a very narrow range. I'll talk about that in a little bit, why it's so interesting. But pH of seven, about 7.4. Milk of magnesia, about 10.5. Household ammonia is about 11. And one important thing to note about the uh, pH scale is it's a logarithmic scale, which means that if I have something that's a pH of 5 and something else that's pH of 3, well, you might say, oh, they're pretty close, right? 3 and a 5, that's really close. No, it's actually the one that has a pH of 3 is 100 times more acidic. So each click on the pH scale is actually a factor of 10. So something that's pH of um, you know, 1 is 10 times more acidic than something with a pH of 2, which is 10 times more acidic than a pH of 3, and so forth. So the scale, you know, you know that, that amount of acidity really changes rapidly because of this logarithmic scale. And so, speaking of logarithms, this is where we actually get the, you know, um, how we actually calculate pH is this formula. pH is equal to the negative log of the hydronium ion concentration. Remember, those square brackets means concentration of. So, concentration of hydronium. Now, you might be freaking out and you're like, oh no, I don't know how to do logarithms. I don't remember all those properties and so forth. It doesn't matter, right? For this course, all you need to know is the log button is a button on your calculator. And so you just you know punch that in, and you're good to go. So this is the formula, and it's a very important formula. But um, let's try using it to actually see this in action. So coffee has a hydronium concentration of about 1.4 times 10 to the negative fifth molar. So what is the pH of this? Well, it's actually pretty easy to figure out. All we need to do is um, we know that pH 
is equal to the negative log of the hydronium concentration. The hydronium concentration in this case is 1.4 times 10 to the negative fifth. All right, so I literally just pull out my calculator and I'm just going to go ahead and um, some calculators you can literally just type in negative log parentheses 1.4 times 10 to the negative fifth close parentheses and hit equals and it works. Um, other calculators you have to go in the opposite direction so you might have to type in 1.4 times 10 to the negative fifth and then hit the log button and then hit the negative button so try both ways see which way your calculator has you do it um, but what you should get is you should get a pH of approximately 4.85 alright so is that acidic basic or neutral well it's less than 7 therefore coffee is acidic one of the reasons it's so bad for your teeth, all those tannic acids. Let's go ahead and try a couple more of these. So, um, in this case, uh, it doesn't even matter what the substance is, but I'm going to go ahead and calculate the pH for each of these. Alright, so remember, pH is defined as the negative log of the hydronium ion concentration. All right, so in this case, pH is equal to the negative log of 4.7 times 10 to the negative 12th. So plug that into my calculator, 4.7, 12, and it looks like I have a pH of 11.33. Just one quick note on sig figs. I don't want you to worry about this too much, but um, sig figs are really weird when it comes to logarithms. So notice that here I have two sig figs in my original number. When I take the log of that, that means I should have two decimal places. All right. So two sig figs turns into two decimal places when you take the log of something. All right. Kind of weird, but just you know, don't freak out about it. But just be aware that that's what's going on here. All right, let's go ahead and try another one. pH is the negative log of 9.9 .9 times 10 to the minus 8th. So, looks like I have a, um, let's see, I type that in right. 9.9 .9 times 10 to the negative 8th. Take the log of that. It's giving me a pH of actually 7.00. Hmm, interesting. All right, and now let's see. Let's try one more. pH is equal to negative log of oops 1.0 times 10 to the minus seventh plug that in and it comes out to exactly 7.00 this time all right so um, let's see what kind of solutions do we have here well this one is basic or alkaline because it's greater than seven this one would be neutral because it's right at seven and this one would also be neutral because it's right at 7. So now we can calculate pH pretty simply, but what about going the opposite direction? Well, if I give you the, uh, the pH, you should be able to calculate the hydronium concentration using this formula right here. The hydronium concentration is equal to 10 raised to the negative pH. Pretty simple. Um, if you are good with um, logs and algebra, you'd actually realize that those are the exact same equation. Um, but anyway, let's go ahead and do this. So lemon juice has a pH of 2.1. I want to know, what's the hydronium ion concentration in there? Well, I just take 10 and raise it to the negative pH, or in other words, 10 to the negative 2.1, and 
10 raised to the 2.1. All right, looks like this comes out to be 0 0.0079, and my units are going to be molar. All right, now notice again with sig figs, just to kind of be aware of this, I had two sig figs. Oh, actually, wait, I messed up. Ooh. I was just testing you to see if you're paying attention. So notice that I only have one decimal place here, which means, honestly, I can only have one sig fig in my answer. So 0 0.008 molar would be my correct answer with the correct number of sig figs. So again, one sig fig, one decimal place, one decimal place, one sig fig, and vice versa. So, all right. Let's go ahead and tr uh, practice with a couple more of these just to make sure that we have this down. All right. So, remember that oops, hydronium concentration is always going to be equal to 10 raised to the negative pH. So in this case, hydronium is equal to um, 10 to the negative 12 point, oops, 12.35. All right, so 10 raised to the um, negative 12.35, 4.5 times 10 to the negative 13th, and my units have to be molar. All right, same type of thing here. I'm just going to do 10 to the negative 1.55 so 10 to the negative 1.55 looks like this time I have 0 0.028 my units will always be molar for my concentration and for this last one 10 raised to the negative 9.26 hopefully these aren't too bad right it's really just a matter of plugging these numbers um, you know, into the formula, and you're done. So 10 raised to the negative 9.26 comes out to about 5.5 .5 times 10 to the negative 10th molar. All right, so far so good, right? Now one more kind of interesting thing is that because we've been dealing with pH, we've been dealing with the H3O plus concentration, right, the hydronium concentration. But we could actually be dealing with the hydroxide concentration instead and deal with what's known as the pOH. All right, and so it, if you look closely at these formulas, you'll see that they are the exact same as, as for pH, except this time they're for pOH, and we're dealing with the hydroxide instead of the hydronium. But we would use these in the exact same way. So let me go ahead and demonstrate this. If I tell you that the hydroxide ion concentration is equal to um, 2.8 times 10 to the negative second molar, and I say, what's the pOH? Well, pOH is simply the negative log of the hydroxide concentration, or in this case, 2.8 times 10 to the negative second. So I plug that in, 2.8 times 10 to the negative second take the log of that, and my pOH is equal to 1.55. All right, so pretty simple. Now, why would we care? Well, it turns out that we can actually easily convert from pH to pOH and vice versa because pOH is plus pH is always equal to exactly 14. So there, you know, that comes that number again, right, 14. Um, yet again shows up. So pH plus pOH is always equal to 14. So on that problem that I just did, what if I actually asked you to give me the pH? So I mentioned that the pOH is 1.55, right? So what is the pH? Well, pH plus pOH is always equal to 14. So therefore, if I just rearrange that, the pH is equal to the pOH, oh, sorry, is equal to 14 minus the pOH. Or in other words, 14 minus 1.55. So 
So 14 minus 1.55 comes out to 12.45. All right, so pOH, pH. Um, notice that they always add up to exactly 14 by definition. So just some interesting things about the human body and how the human body works with uh, varying pHs. So your saliva is typically neutral, maybe a little bit acidic, again, depending on you know certain factors. Your blood maintains a very precise pH, around 7.4, uh, due to buffers, which we'll talk about next. Your stomach, obviously, is very acidic. Your pancreas um, and your small intestine are actually a bit alkaline or basic. Your large intestine is acidic, again, and your urine can vary um, you know, quite a bit. So um, this is actually why enzymes work you know, um, in different portions of your body. So you may have an enzyme, a trypsin or something, that works well in your stomach, but um, you know, because it works, under a good, you know, it works well under acidic pH, but as soon as it hits your small intestine, it stops functioning because the pH changes so much. Now, how does your blood maintain such a good you know, uh, tight range on the pH? Well, it turns out that there's a buffer system in there. So a buffer is a solution that contains components that resist changes in pH when you add either an acid or a base. You can do this typically by adding a weak acid and that weak acid's conjugate base. So a weak acid and a conjugate base, or you could think of it as a weak base and its conjugate acid. But by adding these, and typically you add them in about equal amounts, um, it works really well. It kind of balances things out because if you add a little bit of acid to the, to the solution, it will react with the conjugate base, neutralize it, and your pH doesn't change much. If you add a little bit of base to it, it'll react with the, with the acid, neutralize it, and your pH doesn't change much. And so these are really good for um, when you're doing an, ex an experiment and you need to maintain a constant pH, you add a buffer system to it. Or if you are you know, a person that needs to you know, maintain a very tight pH in your blood, which you do. So you actually have the carbonic acid bicarbonate buffer system in your bloodstream. So carbonic acid is a weak acid. The bicarbonate ion is its conjugate base. And these both exist in your bloodstream. And how does this work? Well, it turns out that whenever you exhale carbon dioxide, you don't actually exhale all of it. Some of it stays in your bloodstream and it mixes with water to form what's called carbonic acid, H2CO3. So this is a weak acid. And then some of that will actually um, react with water and it will um, lose a proton to form this guy over here, which is the bicarbonate ion, and this is a weak base. And so suddenly your bloodstream now contains both a weak acid and a weak base. And so if you um, suddenly get a little bit of, you know, have, get some lemon juice that gets into your bloodstream, oh, it's okay. It reacts with the base, neutralizes it, and you're okay. Or what if you, you know, get some base in there, like some uh, milk of magnesia or something? Oh, it reacts with the acid, neutralizes it, and you're still okay. So it's actually a pretty big deal that you have these buffers in your bloodstream because otherwise you have some major problems. So for instance, um, if your body cannot actually get rid of enough carbon dioxide, maybe because your lungs are failing, you have lung disease or something, you undergo what's called respiratory acidosis. So the um, carbon dioxide builds up in your bloodstream, which then turns into carbonic acid, and your blood pH drops, and it becomes too acidic, and you die. Or you could undergo respiratory alkalosis, which is when your body actually gets rid of too much carbon dioxide. And so you need to keep some of that in your bloodstream. This can happen when you're hyperventilating. And so your blood pH would start to uh, creep up. It would start to become alkaline or basic. And um, so what do you do if someone is hyperventilating? Well, in the movies, you always end up slapping them, right? <laughs> and so I've always wanted to, uh, you know, like in the middle of a test, a student starts hyperventilating and run up and just like, don't worry, I got this, and just smack them upside the head. <laughs> um, but anyway, I would never do that. So um, another thing is that you um, breathe into a paper bag, right? And so by breathing into a paper bag, what are you doing? You're trapping some of that carbon dioxide that you're exhaling, 
and then you're re-inhaling that. And so you're forcing more carbon dioxide back into your bloodstream. Um, now, really, hyperventilating isn't that much of an issue because at some point, if you, you know, it really became too, too dangerous to your body, your brain would just kind of shut it down, you'd go unconscious, and then your breathing would go back to normal. So really, not such a big deal. But it is very important that our blood does maintain this pH, and it's all thanks to buffers. So thank you for uh, sticking around, listening to pH and buffers, and um, I'll see you next time.